We are happy to have Professor Eric Strauss here from the Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam, who will explain us the pitfalls and promises in translating nanomedical treatment from experimental to clinical arterial sclerosis. So basically, we, uh, we heard a uh, complexation of the inflammatory story, and I would like to start with the quote of Steve Jobs, that simple can be harder com than complex. You have to work very hard to keep your thinking clean to actually make it simple. So what I will do is I will try to oversimplify because in the end, if we want to translate the beautiful story that Professor Harold Munger told in to, at the start of eight o'clock, we might lose patients because it's, it's so difficult with all these cells where to focus on. So don't be scared. I'm going to simplify this so you can criticize me all the way through my presentation. So we've heard about atherosclerosis. We know that it's cerebral disease, coronary disease, and peripheral artery disease. And we're doing a lot with statins, and we're very happy that we're doing a good job, but in the end, 70% of events cannot be prevented. So we need to do a little bit more, and we need to find better ways to progress this prevention. Now what I will do is I will briefly talk about you with my favorite cell type, that's the monocyte macrophage, is a potential target to, for unstable lesions. I will tell you about some of the choice of delivery vehicles for local plaque delivery. How are we going to achieve that in humans? And finally, I'm going to tell you about how to make a choice of the compound which we should deliver into the plaque. So basically, if we look over the last years, we've indeed, as we already heard from Harold, that chronic inflammation is crucial. So it all starts with lipid accumulation, but these lipids are cleared and taken up by monocyte macrophages. These macrophages actually become bigger, and these macrophages play a role in destabilizing these lesions, which per se are not really harmful. Now, if we look into, and obviously you can see that this is a specimen where actually it went wrong because this is an autopsy. So in this particular specimen with massive atherosclerosis, we can actually see that there's a lot of infiltrating macrophages. And we already heard that these macrophages make metalloproteinases and they destabilize the plaque. But if we go one step back into patients, we can also see that after events in very high unstable patients, both in the coronary as well as in the cerebrovascular carotids, there is massively inflamed arterial vessel wall and inflamed lesions in patients prone to undergo an event. So actually there is something with these activated monocyte macrophages within the atherosclerotic lesion that could guide us to a better form of therapy. Now, what about these monocyte macrophages? Not so long ago, we thought that actually resident monocytes and macrophages could stay there for ages. There's actually been one Russian study showing that after the Chernobyl disaster, I think in 1986 or something, um, that after the Chernobyl disaster, people undergoing an, an operation many years later still had some remains of the radioactive spillover in their atheromas. So that would imply that these cells have they can be there for decades. Well, there is some movement ongoing there. If you look at this study, obviously it's an animal study in the uh, in Nature Medicine by the group of Robbins. What he actually did is what they gave an osmotic mini pump with BRDU, which labels all the new cells during a certain period of time. And if you then look at the period of four weeks, you can see that after four weeks, one month, all monocyte macrophage cells in atherosclerosis <coughs> sorry, are labeled. So that implies that it's a rapid influx and there's no subset of long lasting cells which have already been there for many months. And then when it removed the osmotic BRDU pump, within one month, <coughs> all cells are unlabeled. So there's a very high turnover of cells within atherosclerotic plaques. And that makes it interesting, because if there's a high turnover, it implies that it has to come from somewhere. So if it comes from somewhere, we, we cannot just focus at the monocyte macrophage making this foam cell. But if the turnover is so high, you need a continuous source for new cells, new monocyte, new macrophage. Where does it come from? 
Well, the, scoop of the group of Narendorf and Sversky, actually, they focused on the bone marrow. So it has to be a continuous production of monocytes a new influx into the lesions, replenishing this inflammatory monocyte macrophage source. But the interesting part is there's no data whatsoever in humans to validate that there actually is increased influx in humans. So what we actually did in humans is we focused at a, uh, 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 well, this is obviously, this is myself, this is me from the inside, uh, and we looked counterparts at patients with heavy atherosclerosis. What we did, we drew blood and we attached technetium to the mononuclear cells and we reinfused our own cells, obviously, into the patient. And we thought, what's happening with these labeled cells? Well, what you can see here in this, to date, healthy subject, you can see that these cells, there are some stickiness of labeled monocytes to the wall, but you can also see that over the hours, these sticky patches, they move to other places. So that implies this is some kind of a patrolling behavior. They don't egress into the atheroma wall. Now see what happens if you do the same in a severely atherosclerotic patients. Not a myocardial infarction, not a widow maker, but severe systemic atherosclerosis. And here you can see there's already accumulation within these predilection spots. And then you can see that after six hours or four and a half hours, at the same spots, the accumulation increases. So that tells you that these white blood cells actively influx in the lesions, accumulating within these advanced atherosclerotic stages. So there, in humans, is a continuous renewal and influx, giving a potential target for future intervention studies. And then we are going to keep it simple, but it's a little bit more disturbing because actually a more recent paper, again by the Robbins group, in Nature Medicine showed something else. Because what they did, and I won't go into detail, I love the experiment, although I'm a, I'm a clinical doctor, they do use the chimeric mouse model. One model was this CD45, one subtype of, of inflammatory cells, and the other model was the CD45, two subset. So you can actually look from what animal these specific subsets of cells comes from. And what they saw that as if they made a connection, you would expect that, that these cells get an admixture. So indeed, if you look at blood monocytes, spleen monocytes, you can see that there's an admixture of the cells from both the chimeric partners. And interestingly, in the atherosclerotic subset, in the atherosclerotic vessel, there's no admixture. So that implies in this case, it's not a continuous influx of new monocyte macrophages in the atheroma. Obli obviously, something else dictates the increased burden of inflammatory cells. And you should read the paper because it's really groundbreaking work. What they show in this paper is that also within the atherosclerotic lesion, there's a continuous proliferation of these monocytes which actually also dictate the inflammatory process within the inflammatory wall. Isn't that fun? This really starts to make atherosclerosis increasingly look like oncology, where there's a lot of oncology on this particular progress or congress. So increasingly, these paths are actually interlinking between atherosclerosis and oncology. So in summary, on the role of the monocyte macrophages, we saw that decreasing macrophage infiltration or proliferation, we don't know yet, in atherosclerotic lesions could be a potential target to stabilize these so-called vulnerable lesions. But the problem is, how do we selectively target these cells within the atheroma? Well, briefly, I will tell you two more things. It's delivery vehicle and then the compound selection. Now, with delivery vehicle, if you look at liposomes, what about these liposomes? They've been around for many decades. Can we actually predict that they get into the atherosclerotic plaque? Well, here's an animal experiment together with Willem Mulder and Mark Labato, where we took the uh, double balloon injury, high fat uh, rabbit model, and we do a dynamic contrast enhanced MRI, which is basically leakage of contrast into the atherosclerotic vessel wall. So let's call this image permeability. And we compared that to the Evans blue infusion, so Evans blue binds to albumin, so you have albumin leakage into the vessel wall, 
and we infused the liposome together with Sci7 to make sure that we could visualize it, and then we looked at the, the uh, ex vivo imaging. Now let's see about the co correlations here. You can see 3D DC MRI in an atherosclerotic aorta, there is a leakage of the contrast, there is leakage of the albumin, and there is leakage of the Sci7 liposome. And in fact, if we look at the correlation, you can see that if you look at the DCE MRI versus the Psi 7 liposome leakage, there's a quite good correlation in the first half an hour. And again, if you look at albumin leakage versus liposome leakage, there's a very good correlation between these leakages. So it seems that we can predict liposome leakage in two atheromatose lesions, and it correlates as well to albumin leakage similarly to contrast leakage on MRI. After six hours, there's still a fairly good correlation, but it's decreasing. And after 24 hours, the correlation is slowly fading away. So what's happening there is, in fact, after 24 hours, it's no longer only intraluminal leakage, but here we get also the periadventitial leakage, which is more difficult to link. So liposomes do leak, and we do seem to be able to be able to predict this. But then the problem is always, that's an experimental model. Uh, uh, model. So as Harold already said, that is a very tiny wall in rabbits. And in humans, we have this massive millimeter lesions of atherosclerosis. So are these data in animals relevant for the human setting? Well, to evaluate that, we actually went back to the human model. And in the human model, we can obviously do much less, but what we can do is actually infuse the pedulated liposome, and in this case, we don't add Psi77, but at the pedulated liposome, you have these polyethylene glycol chains, and obviously, this is not a substance that you and I have in our body. So if we do staining for the patch, we can see what happened to the fate of the liposomes. And if you then take surgical patients, you pre-infuse them with these pedulated liposomes, then you take out during surgery the atheromatose lesions, and you isolate the macrophages within these atheromatous lesions, then we were actually able to show that here in the macrophages isolated from the atherosclerotic plaque, this is the nuclear staining, this CD68 staining, so a macrophage-specific stain, this is polyethylene glycol, so this is the uptake of the exogenously infused liposomes, and here you see the double staining. If we isolate the cells, there's approximately 80% of cells are CD68 macrophages, and of these 80%, the vast majority of these isolated macrophages also stain positive for polyethylene glycol. So yes, if we systemically infuse liposomes, they do reach the macrophages in the atherosclerosis lesions. That's liposomes, but the problem is that still is a very large particle. Can we do better or improve the, the local delivery? Well, there we actually went back to the HDL. We know HDL as the endogenous particle accepting cholesterol from macrophages. So in theory, we already hypothesized that HDL gets to the lipid-laden macrophages because that's its natural role in humans. So what about HDL? So there we went back to the reconstituted HDL, which is much smaller than liposomes. It's 13 versus 85 nanometers. And it has a targeted approach because the APOA1 residing on the HDL particle is a natural ligand for ABCA1 and ABCG1 which is a prominent transporter in the macrophages. So what happens if we infuse this HDL particle? In this case, we did it in mice. Well, if we infuse this in mice, you can see that 24 hours after injection, if we label the HDL as gadolinium, there's a clear accumulation of the HDL compound in the atheromatose lesions. So yes, we can deliver, obviously, HDL to atherosclerotic lesions. Well, what if we load this particular HDL compound with a drug that's called the Trojan horse concept? We don't use HDL as a cholesterol acceptor. We use HDL as a silent drug deliverer, which in theory should work. So if we fill the HDL particle, and let's make it simple, why not use a statin? Has been used in humans 
millions of people, so theoretically there's a lot of safety data. So if we give this HDL statin particle into mice, it becomes very interesting. Look here what happens in atherosclerosis. If we treat a mouse with either placebo, and this is an atherosclerotic mouse model, the APOA2 knockout. Placebo, reconstituted HDL in a low dose, so this is HDL as a carrier, not as a therapeutic intervention. Oral statin systemically, and then the statin reconstituted HDL, so the Trojan horse concept. You can see that in placebo, atherosclerosis progresses throughout the weeks. Following our HDL in low concentrations, it progresses, giving oral statins systemically, atherosclerosis progresses, and then you can see here, if you give the statin or HDL compound, you completely annihilate atherosclerosis progression. And more interestingly, if you give an even higher dose, you also abolish inflammation. And that's fun, because HDL targets the macrophage, so you deliver statins into the macrophage, and thereby you decrease the number of infiltrating macrophages within the lesion. So summary of this part, pedulated liposomes are delivered in atherolesions, HDL is delivered, and uh, it's anti-atherosclerotic. Now the last part, and very briefly, so what about humans? We know that prednisone should work, and last year I presented that if we deliver prednisone in humans, actually it doesn't work. We now have some work to show that prednisone in lipid-laden macrophages actually gives a pro-inflammatory phenotype and increases ER stress. So basically that explains why it doesn't work. So in summary, I would like to thank all these people, collaborations with Mount Sinai, the Academic Medical Center, Enceladus, and obviously the Nanoatero Consortium, where we have a very exciting collaboration. Thank you for your attention.